Hello, welcome to the Friday, April 14th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Orlando, Florida. Pretty interesting diary today by Rob about how to use NetShell to capture packets for a specific process. If you're using TCP dump or Wireshark to collect packets, then of course you're losing the information as to which process did create packets or receive them. Well, it turns out if you are collecting network packets directly in NetShell, then this information is retained and you can later Later, filter by it. In order to do so, you need to load the NetShell capture in Microsoft Message Analyzer, which allows you to then select messages, which includes packets by process, and from there you can export these packets into a PCAP file for further analysis. And Akamai is reporting that they're seeing large denial of service attacks that use connectionless LDAP as an amplification vector. For connectionless LDAP, you have LDAP servers that are exposed as part of a voice over IP gateways. Turns out that a lot of systems that are running SIP also use LDAP for authentication and do not properly protect the LDAP server. For connectionless LDAP, the queries being used here are about 50 bytes in length, while the reply is close to three kilobytes in length. So you certainly have a pretty neat amplification. And of course, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands, vulnerable systems out there that can be used as amplifier. And Juniper released a number of bulletins fixing various vulnerabilities in JunoS. Some of these vulnerabilities affect open source software that is included in Juniper's operating system. One of the more interesting vulnerabilities being addressed in this update is atomic fragments. Uh, this is really an issue with the IPv6 specification. The specification has been amended recently, allowing you to turn off uh, this feature. The problem arises if a host receives a message that a packet is too large and needs to be fragmented, but the MTU advertised is less than 1280 bytes. MTUs of less than 1280 bytes are not valid in IPv6, so operating systems are supposed to send atomic fragments, which are really complete packets that include a fragment header. Since this required behavior has led to potential denial of service attacks, a new RFC 8021 was published that explicitly deals with this problem, essentially allowing users to turn off atomic fragments. With this latest update of JunoS, atomic fragments are turned off by default, but the user does still have the option to turn them on again in case turning them off causes problems. And SAP released a critical patch for its Trex search engine. This vulnerability being addressed by this update was actually originally found in 2015 and thought to be fixed in December 2015. But this issue now resurfaced. So in software, it's in particular important that you apply this update because exploits for the old versions may easily be adapted to this new version of of the vulnerability. And remember, just a week ago, we had an attack against the tornado sirens in Dallas, which were set off by the attacker. Duo Security now has a nice blog with a number of details about how this hack apparently worked. First of all, to set off these sirens via wireless signals, all you need is a UHF 450 megahertz signal and the actual code being transmitted to the sirens to start them is encoded in DTMF, the dual tone frequency format that you usually have in touch tone dialing. These signals are sent unencrypted, so it wouldn't be all that difficult for an attacker to record these signals during a prior activation of these sirens. 
Now, the other facet to this attack was that it wasn't possible to turn off the sirens remotely. As it turns out, the attacker also had physical access likely to one of the control systems and was able to lock operators out from the system by changing its password. The system also doesn't appear to be air-gapped as apparently there is a mobile app that operators can use in order to remotely turn on and off these sirens. Lots of additional details in the Duo security blog. So if you're more interested in how these sirens and how this particular hack probably worked, then take a look at the full blog. And well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.